Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to share this um, very interesting round table with Dr. Immaculada Roldan uh, about antibiotic therapy. We are very lucky to have three excellent speakers that sure will help us to use the antibiotic uh, therapy in every case in our clinical practice. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Dominica Angelillo, well known uh, by every of us from uh, Jacksonville University. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for the kind introduction. And again, I want to thank the, the meeting organizers for the invite. And again, once again, the, the sponsors uh, for, their, uh, for their support. So uh, what I'll be doing now over the next uh, uh, 20 minutes, and I have my, I have my watch. Uh, I know that we're running late, so I will not go beyond my 20 minutes, uh, is speak about uh, a controversial topic, which is uh, Prasidal versus Ticagrelor following uh, the most recent uh, uh, trial results. And it's kind of a difficult topic uh, because, uh, as you heard from the previous presentation, uh, we do not have head-to-head uh, -head comparisons. Uh, so what I'll do, I will be uh, giving you uh, my personal view uh, and my interpretation of the trials and uh, try to conclude also with some uh, practical uh, implications. Uh, these are my disclosures. So as a way of introduction, uh, we do know that uh, there is a clear need for uh, improving uh, P2Y12 uh, mediated uh, uh, platelet uh, activation. And uh, definitely the uh, two uh, uh, new strategies are represented by uh, Prasugrel and Ticagrelor. Uh, just very quickly, as you know, Prasergo is a third generation tenopyridine, so same family as Clopidogrel, but with the main difference, it has a more favorable uh, pharmacokinetic profile, therefore generates more of the active metabolite, which irreversibly uh, blocks the P2Y12 receptor. On the other hand, Ticagrelor is a first in class of a new drug, uh, which is a, a called CPTP, and has a direct mechanism of, of action with reversible binding on the P2Y12 receptor. And from a pharmacodynamic standpoint, uh, this is essentially what you see. Uh, I like to use the rule of what you see here, the three Ps, to define their pharmacodynamics. It's more prompt, more potent, and more predictable. And this is for both drugs. You see a very quick effect, a very potent effect, and very little variability. So I would say from a pharmacodynamic standpoint, there's sort of uh, equipoise, uh, because they have all, uh, both of them have these uh, three Ps. So the uh, question is, you know, what do the clinical trial data say? And I've highlighted here what, in my opinion, are the uh, key trials with regards to the uh, uh, two drugs. With Prasergo, the pivotal trial was the Triton Timmy 38, and we have a series of other trials. Uh, some of these are pharmacodynamic studies, such as Trilogy ACS, uh, such as Feathers and Generation and Triplet, but we also have clinical studies such as Trilogy ACS and the uh, COS trial. Uh, with regards to Ticago, we mostly rely on the PLATO trial, and this is simply because the drug uh, was developed a few years after uh, uh, Prasergo. But as you can see here in, in gray, we have a large number uh, of ongoing uh, trials with Ticagrelor. And I would say a very ambitious uh, clinical trial program because these not only are limited to ACS, but they look into secondary prevention post-MI, they look at a peripheral vascular disease, they look at cerebral vascular disease, and looking at secondary prevention exclusively in uh, diabetics. But I think another take home message from this slide here is, and you'll see this from my presentation, is that uh, one of the advantages that we have with Ticagrelor is the design of the PLATO trial, which to a certain extent really embraces all the information that we have from this long list of trials uh, with, uh, with Prasergo, and you will see uh, why. So uh, I think it's important when uh, we compare these two drugs, it's the first highlight uh, that uh, there are significant uh, differences uh, between the trial designs. And uh, first of all, the patient population, uh, a Triton was an ACS trial for patients undergoing PCI, so very, very uh, selected inclusion criteria. Uh, PLATO was a full spectrum of ACS, irrespective of uh, management. I'm sorry. In uh, Triton, patients were not pretreated, with exception of primary PCI. 
while this was allowed in, in, uh, in Plato, loading doses in the two trials were different also because of differences in timing of conduct of the trials and also the duration of the studies uh, were different being longer with uh, Triton uh, than in Plato. So the uh, question is, is there a winner between the two drugs? And my answer is no. I think they're both winners because both trials support the concept that using a more potent drug compared with a standard clopidogrel in a high risk setting such as patients with ACS, you do have a significant reduction in ischemic events. Here you see the Kaplan-Meier curves with, with uh, Prasigrel. Here you see the Kaplan-Meier curves with, with Ticagalor. And uh, as I also mentioned yesterday, this also always comes with a price. And uh, as I typically to say, there's no such thing of a more potent antiplatelet strategy which is not associated with increased risk of, of bleeding. This is the non-cabbage related bleeding with, uh, with Prasigrel, as you can see, uh, a higher risk, but this also included fatal, uh, uh, life-threatening and fatal bleeds. And here you see the non-cabbage related bleeding with, with, uh, with Ticagalor, which however did not have an increase in the fatal and the life-threatening bleeds. So sometimes there's a little bit of confusion with, with Ticagalor and, uh, and the bleeding concept, uh, which is largely related to the definition in the trial. Uh, the trial included the uh, cabbage uh, major bleeding, which to a certain extent diluted the overall uh, bleeding outcomes. But when we look specifically at the non-cabbage bleeding, uh, I would say they're virtually identical. Here you see the number needed to harm, and it's virtually identical between the two drugs. So I can say it's quite fair to say that uh, both drugs show a significant reduction in ischemic events, and there's a potential risk for bleeding, but overall the, there's a favorable safety uh, 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 profile uh, with the difference that with Prasigo, we do see that uh, slight increase in the uh, fatal and life-threatening bleeds. And so based on this information, uh, we have the uh, practice guidelines, which uh, clearly, uh, these are the European guidelines, which uh, I typically uh, uh, show because I think they are more objective, uh, saying that we should be using the uh, uh, newer agents uh, in all our ACS patients uh, and consider clopidogrel uh, only in those patients in whom there's a contraindication or where the drug is not, uh, not available. So when dealing with Prasigo versus Ticago, and one of the things that I always like to emphasize with my, uh, with my fellows is always know the contraindications uh, for, the, for, for a drug because safety comes first. So uh, this slide is kind of uh, uh, put together from both the European Medical Agency and the FDA uh, label for the two compounds. We have four absolute contra three absolute contraindications for Prasigo, high risk of bleeding, prior to stroke, and presence of hypersensitivity and four absolute contraindications for Ticagalor, which is the high risk of bleeding, prior hemorrhagic uh, uh, stroke, severe hepatic dysfunction, hypersensitivity. And then we have what we, I call precautions, or you know, use with caution. With prasugrels, the elder and the low weight, sometimes these are considered as contraindications. That is not true. It's use with caution. And for those patients that require surgery, you need to wait uh, seven days. Regards to uh, Ticagalor, uh, this is coming more from the European Medical Agency. Caution those patients with advanced respiratory diseases, bradyarrhythmias without a pacemaker. Wording in, in, the, in the ACC guidelines for compliance because of the twice daily administration. From the product information, there are drug interactions with Ticagalor. Aspirin dose, which is more of an issue in North America. And for those patients requiring surgery, the uh, guidelines uh, indicate to wait at least uh, uh, five days. So at this point, I could stop my talk here and say, you just do whatever you want. And, but uh, coming from Jacksonville, Florida to Seville is quite of a long trip. And I said, you know, why don't I go ahead and, and expand upon this and give my practical and personal experience uh, on when I use the two uh, drugs. So this is what I do in my practice. I'm not saying this is the correct thing, but I'm going to give you the reason why I do so. And let's start off with Prasugo. So when do I use Prasugo? I use them in my primary PCI. I use them in my diabetics. I'm going to use them in my recurrent ACS. And the patients, those rare patients who have a stent thrombosis. And the reason for this decision making is based on my personal interpretation of the trial data. And as we heard from the previous uh, presentation, danger ahead, watch out for indirect comparisons. You know, they're, they're largely flawed, uh, but uh, I'm not a biostatistician. Uh, I'm a, a practicing interventionist, and when I'm in the cat lab, I need to make a decision. Which drug do I use based on what's my reality, what's best for my patient in my situation, which may not be the same for yours. So let's start off with primary PCI, with STEMI. Here you see the data from the two trials. 
with uh, Plato, over 7,000 patients uh, with a primary PCI, you see that at one year, uh, there's a relative risk reduction of 13% with a p-value of 0.07, which was consistent with the overall trial results. So we should not consider this p-value as negative. It's consistent with the overall trial results. But what was interesting with the trial is that there was a, a, a delay in the separation of the curves, which took at least two months in the STEMI uh, uh, cohort. In Triton, uh, we see uh, what we typically see in most STEMI trials. When you use a more potent antiplatelet strategy, you have an early separation of, of the curves with significant differences at 30 days, which persist out up to 12 months with a number needed to treat of 41. Now, the reason why I use this in my clinical practice is because one of the challenges that I have is that most of my patients are not able to continue with the drug for more than two, three months because, because of costs, either costs for the patients or costs for insurance companies. So the question is, where do I get more bank for my buck? And I say I get it more with, with Prosser, and this is the reason why it's my treatment of choice. The other reason is that the drug was approved sooner in the United States, which also led to a, a, a greater uptake in the setting of STEMI uh, uh, protocols. Now, one of the critiques towards the STEMI analysis in, in Triton was that part of the data were driven by the so-called secondary PCI cohort and a statement of that in primary PCI, there was no benefit. Now, I want to start off with saying that the interaction analysis were negative, but uh, there was a decision to move forward with, the, uh, uh, with these analysis and say, let's take away all the chemical MIs and just focus on the spontaneous MIs, the real myocardial infarctions. This is analysis that will be published soon in, in JAK Intervention. And when just looking at the spontaneous MIs, the true MIs, you see here in the primary PCI cohort, a further separation of the curves with a nearly a 50% relative risk reduction at 30 days, which remain consistent over time with interaction analysis, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was negative. The other aspect with, uh, with Prasergo, there is more experience. This is analysis which was published a few weeks ago in, in AJC, analysis from the Infuse AMI, and you can see, compared with Clopidogrel, significant reduction in MACE, a significant reduction in death, a significant reduction in stent thrombosis, and no trade-off in major uh, bleeding. So I would say that the data are pretty much consistent um, uh, for my uh, clinical practice. Let's speak about uh, diabetes. Uh, this has been, uh, uh, studying diabetic platelets has been kind of a hobby of mine for the past several years, and I've had ample opportunity to work uh, both with the Plato and the Triton uh, TIMI38 uh, data sets. Uh, I will not speak about uh, current Oasis 7 and high-dose clopidogrel. I think this should be uh, completely abandoned in today's clinical practice. What we see with Ticagalor is, again, a consistent effect. Please do not let uh, these confidence interval, intervals fool you. The P for interaction uh, was, uh, was above 0.1. But what we can see in Triton with Prasugel, and this is something endorsed also in the European guidelines, that there appears to be something more favorable in uh, patients with, with diabetes. And I think you cannot neglect this 30% uh, relative risk reduction in this patient population uh, with a risk that was even higher among insulin-dependent uh, diabetics. With regards to recurrent ACS while on clopidogrel, I think this is a very, very important topic which uh, uh, has sometimes not been well considered in clinical, clinical trials. Now, when we conduct a clinical trial, uh, we have an endpoint, and when the patient reaches that endpoint, it's included in the Kaplan-Meier curve, and it's game over. But in a clinical trial, and in real life, if a patient survives their first event, they can go ahead and have another event. So how do we account for that? And this was a postdoc analysis from the Triton trial, looking at those patients who survived their first event, because obviously if they died, they're dead. They cannot have further events. And what you can see that uh, there is a further reduction in uh, the outcomes with, uh, with Prasgrill and also significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality. The take home message here, and this is getting back to a clinical case that we had discussed last night, if you do have a vent, an event while a patient is on clopidogrel, you need to switch drug. The patient was lucky enough that that event did not lead to mortality. You need to switch drug. We did a similar analysis, uh, and we published this in circulation uh, last year. Uh, the first author was uh, one of the Timmy fellows, uh, Dr. Coley, and, 
And uh, what we did found is that when we look at the overall events, uh, there was a significant reduction, but when we're looking at just the secondary events, uh, this did not reach statistical significance. Again, use with caution because it is a, a post-doc analysis, but again, if I have to make a, a choice and I have a patient with an event while on clopidogrel, if there aren't any contraindications, I'll use prasigrel. If not, I would use a ticagrel. Now, stent thrombosis, it's a very rare phenomenon. Um, sometimes this may be related to uh, multiple factors. Uh, we do know that from the data that uh, Triton Timothy being a PCI trial, probably for this reason, uh, you do have a, a significant reduction in uh, stent thrombosis, which you also see with Plato. But I can say that in our clinical practice, when we have those few patients that we do see a stent thrombosis in while on clopidogrel, or sometimes even if the patient is not on clopidogrel, if for whatever reason non compliance, our first drug of choice is, is prasigrel. So the take home message here is that there's a common denominator with, with prasigrel. The greatest benefits, as shown in the, in the Triton trial, were those patients with high thrombotic risk. If you look at this STEMI, diabetes, stent thrombosis, recurrent ACS, and all the analysis shown that uh, there's increased ischemic benefit with minimal differences in bleeding, and these have shown to be the most cost effective in uh, subsequent uh, analysis. Now the next question is, well, when do I use Ticagrelor? I think Ticagrelor is a very useful drug. Uh, obviously, it has the great advantage of being uh, 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 applicable in patients with a prior TIA and ischemic stroke. Uh, this is uh, very important, at least in my clinical practice, although in the clinical trial, it only represented 4% of the patient population. When we look at large registries, the risk of having a, a second vascul vascular bed involved with atherosclerosis is nearly 20 25%. In my clinical practice, working in the Southeast United States, with a very large African American community and high prevalence of uh, cerebrovascular events, this percentage is almost 20%. And I believe that, again, in these high risk patients, you need to use a newer agent. And so, uh, Ticagrelor is definitely a drug that fits very well uh, in my patients with prior TIA or stroke with this high thrombotic risk profile. And here you see the data uh, on the prior TIA or stroke from the uh, uh, PLATO trial. And there are a few take home messages here. First of all, uh, this is a very high risk patient population. Very high risk. You see the event rates, this is something that we know. And we see that Ticagla has shown to be associated with a nearly 40% relative risk reduction out at one year. Now this analysis has been, uh, has been deeply criticized. There was a, uh, an accompanying editorial in, in circulation because the sample was based only on 1,000 patients. So one can say, is this enough to guarantee safety? My, my opinion, the trial did not show any signal. Uh, we now have several years of experience with post-marketing uh, analysis, and I feel very comfortable in using this drug in my prior to or stroke. The uh, second bullet point is patients with medically managed ACS. It is, it is a reality, although I'm an interventionist, and we say, oh, there's no such thing as medically managed ACS, but the truth is uh, we do have a lot of these patients, which represent around 16% of, uh, uh, of our population uh, coming in with an ACS, and clearly, again, very high-risk patient population, just like with the prior to our stroke. And what I believe is most remarkable, and I think largely derived from this patient population, is the mortality benefit. This is something, obviously, uh, an advantage of, of, of Ticago, which has shown to be consistent in all subgroup analysis. I do believe that, in part, it is derived through differences in trial design and with the higher rates of mortality in the clopidogrel arm, but uh, something definitely very useful in my uh, uh, clinical practice. We cannot say the same for uh, Prasaril. This is These are the results of the Trilogy ACS, which was specifically designed for a medically managed ACS patient population. The trial did not meet the primary endpoint. Very nice post-group and subgroup analysis. We can speak as much as we want of all these interesting, but when you have a primary outcome which was not met, unfortunately, we cannot apply it to our clinical practice. But I think it's a very informative trial, and I think the most informative aspect of the trial was safety because Trilogy ACS was designed based on lessons learned uh, from Triton Timmy 38. Do not include those patients who have harm with the drug. And as you can see, uh, the uh, safety profile was very similar between the two uh, drugs. So I think a very informative uh, uh, trial. And uh, last but not least, uh, we, we have uh, uh, accumulating evidence with, of patients with tinopyridine allergy, mostly to clopidogrel. What do we do? And as I mentioned yesterday, this is just like antibiotics. You switch class, period. So I spoke about the bulk of our patient population. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit uh, of uh, some specific subgroups. 
who are the elderly and, and, and the low weights. Now, unfortunately, I don't have too much experience with low weight uh, patients because in uh, my geographical area, the mean body mass index is 40. And uh, so I can speak a little bit more to, uh, to the elderly. Um, definitely there's some encouraging data coming from pharmacodynamics, and these are actually generated uh, mostly from our lab, uh, looking at a five milligram of prasugrel. But I'm gonna be very honest. I mean, this is pharmacodynamic data. We have more evidence uh, from, from, the, from the PLATO trial. Um, but I also believe that the elderly patients are really a high risk for bleeding. And so if it's a low risk patient, I will continue to use clopidogrel. Um, but definitely, I think in the higher risk, such as a STEMI, a recurrent ACS, uh, I, do consider, I do consider ticagalor. Um, I do follow, however, the FDA guideline that if the, it is an elderly patient and the patient has diabetes or prior MI, a prasugrel is a good consideration as well. I'm going to wrap up in the last few minutes with some practical considerations, um, which uh, emerge a lot, especially in European practices. Uh, the first is represented by the fact that many patients are pretreated uh, with a clopidogrel, and one of the questions is what to do if I want to switch, if I want to add a new, a new agent. And I'll give you the answer right here. Let's start off with, uh, with Ticago. With Ticago, it's very simple uh, because we have the answer from the clinical trial where nearly half the patients were pretreated with clopidogrel, and the analysis clearly showed uh, that there were no implications on the efficacy and safety. So the clear-cut answer, is yes, it is okay to switch. Don't be afraid. Just switch with a loading dose. The question becomes for Prasugo, where in the trial, patients who were pretreated with clopidogrel were excluded. And so there is a need for a dedicated trial. Now, we have some answers from the Trilogy ACS trial, where 96% of patients were actually pretreated with clopidogrel and then switched to, to Prasugrel. Uh, but uh, along with the sponsors, we decided to, and also per request of the uh, drug regulating agencies, to do a study, and this is the triplet trial, uh, to look in those patients who were pretreated with clopidogrel in ACS settings, so non-STEMI and STEMI, if there was any type of drug interaction with switching to, to prasugrel. Just to keep things simple, I'm not going to go into the details. You can see here pretty consistent uh, results. So uh, it's okay from a pharmacodynamic study to switch. And I'm going to show you this very simple cartoon on, on why. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Mr. Platelet with the P2Y12 receptors. And you can see that if you give a loading dose of prasugrel, you generate more active metabolite and you block more of the receptors. Here you see again Mr. Platelet. And if you give a loading dose of clopidogrel, you have less active metabolite, you block less receptors. What happens if I give a loading dose of uh, prasugrel? Well, you generate more active metabolite, you're going to block the remaining receptors. Okay, you can't block more receptors than what you have. The metabolite's very unstable, so it gets eliminated. So the take-home message here is there's no drug interaction, one, and there's no possibility of overdosing because you cannot block more pre 2 i 12 receptors than what are currently available. So in my clinical practice, I always reload if I have to. Now, given the rapid effects of these agents, the question is, is there a need for a pretreat? And I can speak for hours and debate on, the, on what's the clinical evidence for pretreatment. The thing is, the guidelines largely support pretreatment, uh, with the exception of the PCI guidelines, which have changed a little bit uh, their position. Uh, but this is really based on very limited and inconsistent evidence. Uh, we have some uh, archive data from the CURE trial, which led to this uh, uh, guideline in 2002, uh, but was not supported in the, stu in the CREDO study. And remember, CURE, the mean time of pretreatment was 10 days, and this was a trial where patients were not intended for an invasive strategy. However, uh, looking at a more modern era, we have the COS trial, which evaluated this concept and showed that pretreatment is not the way to go. And this was a trial where the strategy of pretreatment versus non-pretreatment was part of the randomization. One can ask me, well, will we see the same results with Ticagalor? Remember, in Plato, that was not part of the randomization because everybody was pretreated. My general opinion is why would you see any differences if the drugs have equipoise in terms of pharmacodynamic effects? We would need a trial. Fortunately, the only trial that we have is the Atlantic study, uh, which is being conducted in, in primary PCI, looking at a surrogate endpoint, and the results will probably be released towards the end of this year, looking at pretreatment versus non-pretreatment with Ticagalor. So uh, sort of to kind of conclude, is there a winner? And the answer is, is clearly no, there is not a winner. Uh, I gave you my practical perspective and explanations, um, and we do need a head-to-head -head cl uh, clinical trial. And the trial actually has been designed, and it's the ISO-REACT-5 uh, trial, 
which has recently started in enrollment. And it's really going to take into consideration the various aspects, not only comparing the two drugs, but also evaluating uh, pretreatment versus non-pretreatment between these two agents. Uh, this, is a, this is a study which is not being sponsored by anyone. It's just to the courtesy of many investigators across the globe. And hopefully, these results will be available in the next uh, uh, three years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, the talk is open for discussion. Any question from the audience? Yes. There is Dr. Marco. Yeah. In between, Dr. Marco. Excuse me. No work. Thank you so much, Dominic. It was uh, not surprisingly a fantastic talk. I follow you 100%. I have only one problem in fitting into your presentation, is that you never mention nor emphasize the mortality difference that you do see in one study no, and not in the other. Mm -hmm. So the question to you, you, I guess, disbelieve that the data will be reproducible then. Otherwise, the whole reasoning behind which agent to choose I think should be really down to zero because if you have a mortality difference with one drug and not with the other, I think all the Perfect. argumentation gets yeah, So I actually weaker. did speak briefly about it on, on the non-invasive trial and, and definitely I have mentioned that the mortality benefit is something extra for, for, for Ticagalor, um, which was not seen with Prasero. And you, you may say the reason. And my personal opinion, there, there's probably a combined reason. Uh, the mortality rates in the clopidogrel arm with Ticago, as, as, as you well know, was a little bit higher than uh, other trials with clopidogrel. So there's clearly an aspect of the patient population that was enrolled in the trial, maybe higher risk, maybe when, in whom clopidogrel was less effective. That's one. Two, there could be something really related to the drug, off-target effects. We don't know. I do believe that the ongoing trials will provide some more insights. Now, with regards to Prasigo, we did not see that because it was clearly a different type of trial. But there was a numerical reduction. And we can play with statistical games. I didn't put up the slide because I didn't want to be controversial. What if we were taking Prasigo and used the, the, uh, the, the relative risk reduction from that trial with a larger patient population that would almost have reached significance as well? So I think that within the trial, you can speak about the drug. There was a mortality benefit. It's an advantage. Um, we cannot say that for Prasigo. Uh, but again, they are clearly different trials. Thanks, Dominic. Um, thank you for your clever view. But uh, you, haven't, uh, you haven't spoken about the dosage. When you consider to reduce dose, for example, to 5 milligrams, or increase the dose looking, for example, for uh, uh, higher loading dose like 100% of prasuel? Uh, good point, and I didn't speak about that just for a stake of time, and I wanted to be within my, my 20 minutes. So the, the dose modification is a little bit tricky because it's really all based on, on the pharmacodynamic data, no clinical data. Uh, and they're very interesting, and as you know, we do a lot of these. Uh, but from this standpoint, uh, I do think that here we, there is an advantage, for example, of Ticago, which shows a consistency of the effect uh, regardless of, of anything. And they'll be very informative, the trials that we're doing, but I typically uh, keep uh, the standard dose. And I can say, despite us having generated most of the data with five milligrams in our lab, I've never used it in my clinical practice. That's just an example. Yeah. Wonderful talk, Dominique. Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, lecture, and I have a question. I understood that you recommend a uh, loading dose with prasugrel when uh, you need to switch from clopidogrel in patients with a STEMI that receive uh, previously uh, a loading dose of uh, clopidogrel with uh, 600 milligrams. And how do you know that is safe, this strategy, because the clinicians have uh, some doubts about that. Yes, and so we'll, we'll never have an answer. So that's the, that's the first thing. We'll never have a, a trial 
assessing safety. Uh, in the data that we do have, however, we, uh, we didn't have any signals and we rely on, some, on, on biology and also on, on clinical practice. And apparently, uh, this appears to be w something which is accepted. And this is now also accepted within the product label. The FDA just uh, three months ago did up the, update the label to consider the possibility of switching, uh, which was originally not within the label based on, on this data. So we're able to convince the FDA, uh, which is, as mentioned before, a little, is a little bit more thorough. Um, so I feel very, very comfortable in my clinical practice. And, uh, Dominic, uh, ba based on uh, triplet uh, result, uh, how do you perform uh, switches and strategies from clopidogrel to prasugrel in patients previously loaded with clopidogrel? Uh, timing from this loading dose and uh, how, uh, how, how milligrams. Okay. And if, uh, one more, okay. if the GP inhibitor use in the cat lab is a concern in this system. Yeah. So this is a very good question, you know, the relationship of timing uh, from getting this, for example, the 600 milligram loading dose of clopidogrel. My simple answer, I don't care, it doesn't matter. When I have the patient on the cat lab, the patient had gone 600 milligram in the emergency room, I don't care. On the cat lab table, I'll give the 60 milligram. Because again, you're acting through a different metabolism process, first of all. And second, once you generate these active metabolites, they're gonna go ahead and block the receptor. And I'm for sure Prasergol is gonna get there sooner. And what, what, since the active metabolite is very unstable, it's just gonna get eliminated. And it doesn't matter what I use in the cat lab. If I do or do not use a 2B3 inhibitor, I don't use too many 2B3 inhibitors, but uh, if I were to use it, it really doesn't matter because that's also acting on a different pathway. So I just, I keep things simple. If I believe the patient has an indication, I use it in the cat lab and I start off with a loading dose because what happens a lot, especially in US practices, is mostly the interventionalist who's dictating which uh, P2Y12 inhibitor should be used. Question? Yes, uh, one question related with the uh, non-invasive strategy in patients with acute coronary syndrome. In the PLATO trial, there is a similar benefit in the patients treated invasively and non-invasively. However, in the trilogy, there is not any benefit of prasurel in this group of patients. However, the uh, theoretical potency of the, of the two drugs are very similar. What is the explanation for this apparent paradox? Yeah, I, I think in, in, in trilogy ACS, uh, this was largely driven by how the trial was conducted. Because if you look at an analysis, which was recently uh, published of those patients who would be treated like you treat in Spain and I treat in the United States, uh, who may have a medical management, but where you decide that after angiography, there was actually a significant reduction in cardiovascular events with Prasagrel. And so I think there was a huge mistake on behalf of the sponsors trying to push to enroll patients in the trial and they enroll patients in geographical areas who do not have the same level of care as in the United States and, and, and Western Europe. And I think that really skewed the results because I do believe in, in, in modern uh, ACS treatment, the vast majority of patients who come in with an ACS in some shape or form do get their ana the coronary anatomy evaluated. And I think it's the correct thing to do and truly evaluate if that is a medically managed ACS or not or just a false troponins, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there was a strong bias within the trial, and the after angiography really clarifies that. But the trial was negative. Okay, thank you, Lemony. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, could I just make one, one brief comment? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, it's coming back to Marco's point about the mortality. Um, so, so if you look at the, um, the Plato, uh, there are 900 deaths. Uh, so that's a pretty well-powered uh, sample, uh, and the p-value is less than 0 0.001. In Triton, the hazard ratio is 0.95. There's 400 deaths, so it is less powered, but the signal is 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 different. And um, whilst we can't make a direct comparison from an indirect comparison, uh, I think the level of evidence is 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 very different. Uh, so. Um, uh, 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 coming back to your point, I, I think that um, the evidence for uh, um, Ticagalor reducing mortality 
based on the data presented is strong. And, uh, and, and I would concur, as I also mentioned with Marco, but I think it's, it's going to be also very interesting to see what we'll find from, from the ongoing trials, and it's going to be very interesting, especially with, with, with Pegasus, uh, which is going to even be a larger trial, uh, to evaluate if, if Ticagor is going to show a similar mortality benefit. And I do think that if the ongoing trials are going to show similar things, definitely it would be the treatment of choice for everybody because you cannot refute or dispute the benefit of, 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 of reducing cardiovascular death. Thank you, Nagel. Okay. Sincerely, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Ángel Cerquier. He is a very well-known cardiologist leader working in Barcelona. He is the clinical director of cardiovascular disease in Belvici Hospital, and he is one of the best quality, uh, qualified experts to address the is, this issue. When to use oral post-ACC anticoagulation? Um, eh, muchas gracias. Eh, que, quería, eh, en primer lugar, agradecer al comité organizador la amable invitación para participar en este excelente simposio. Y realmente para mí es un privilegio el poder hacer esta presentación. Habíamos comentado con el comité organizador de dar la, la charla en español y eh, seguro que la daré más rápidamente en el tiempo mantenido, eh, aunque si después hacemos las preguntas eh, las podemos hacer perfectamente en inglés. Eh, aunque englobados dentro de los síndromes coronarios agudos, eh, conjuntamente los pacientes con infarto agudo de miocardio con elevación del segmento ST tienen algunas características diferenciales con respecto a los pacientes sin elevación eh, persistente del segmento ST. Diferencias desde el punto de vista del mecanismo fisiopatológico, desde el punto de vista de la presentación y también desde el punto de vista del de pronóstico inmediato. Sin embargo, existe una absoluta concordancia con respecto a las recomendaciones del manejo invasivo inicial en los pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos. Estos son eh, un resumen de las guías para el manejo, de las guías europeas para el manejo de pacientes con infarto agudo de miocardio con elevación del segmento ST en las que recomienda la angioplastia primaria como tratamiento de reperfusión sobre la fibrinolisis con una clase 1 nivel de evidencia A. También las guías europeas en el manejo de pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos sin elevación del segmento eh, o sin elevación persistente del segmento ST recomiendan una eh, estrategia invasiva y revascularización, sobre todo en pacientes con algún criterio de alto riesgo, con una clase 1, también nivel de evidencia A. Adicionalmente, existe consenso eh, con respecto a, la, a las recomendaciones del tratamiento antitrombótico inicial, actuando en las dos vías, sobre la cascada de la coagulación, con los anticoagulantes parenterales, eh, fondoparinux, heparina no fraccionada, heparina de bajo peso molecular o bivalirudina, y eh, con los eh, antiplaquetarios que actúan sobre la vía de activación y agregación plaquetaria, aspirina conjuntamente con clopidogrel, prasugrel o ticagrelor, o bien los inhibidores de la glicoproteína 2B3A. Adicionalmente, las guías recomiendan continuar con el doble tratamiento antiplaquetario como mínimo un año o más después del episodio agudo. Por tanto, ante la pregunta de cuándo usar anticoagulación oral después de un síndrome coronario agudo, la primera conclusión aparentemente es nunca. Eh, Espero en los próximos 19 minutos eh, comentar los puntos que figuran en esta diapositiva en la cual es posible que modifiquemos sensiblemente esta conclusión. En primer lugar, comentaremos eh, aspectos en relacionados a las limitaciones del tratamiento antitrombótico en los síndromes coronarios agudos, el papel potencial que pueden tener los anticoagulantes orales después de este síndrome, la evidencia que existe actualmente en la literatura con respecto al papel, sobre todo, de los nuevos anticoagulantes en el escenario después del síndrome coronario agudo y eh, la potencial identificación de sus grupos de pacientes que podían beneficiarse. Acabaremos con tres diapositivas en relación a las conclusiones. Con respecto al primer punto, existe la sensación de que posiblemente se ha llegado al techo de tratamiento antitrombótico inicial en los pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos. Estos son, por ejemplo, datos del estudio TAO, en el que un inhibidor directo del factor 10A, el otamixaban, fue evaluado en pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos, infarto, eh, eh, síndrome coronario agudo sin elevación del segmento ST, en los que se planteaba una estrategia invasiva 
pueden observar cómo la, el, el otamixaban no condicionó ni, ningún impacto en la reducción de eventos isquémicos y sí que condicionó consistentemente un incremento marcado en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos, teniendo en cuenta además que el grupo de comparación era eh, heparina no fraccionada y eptifibatide. Esta diapositiva pertenece al estudio ACOAST, en la cual se evaluó también en pacientes con síndrome coronario agudo sin elevación del segmento ST, si una estrategia antiplaquetaria más agresiva podía condicionar un impacto pronóstico eh, significativo. Los pacientes fueron randomizados a prasugrel eh, lo más precozmente posible o bien administrar prasugrel en el momento de la angiografía. Y pueden observar de nuevo que eh, el tratamiento, o el prasugrel dado de forma eh, muy precoz, no condicionaba ningún impacto eh, óptimo en la reducción de eventos isquémicos y sí que condicionaba un incremento marcado en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos. Por lo cual, es posible que se haya llegado a un determinado techo de eh, la utilización de un tratamiento antitrombótico potente en la fase más inicial del síndrome coronario agudo. Estas diapositivas ya han sido presentadas, son eh, diapositivas que pertenecen al estudio CURE, al estudio Triton TIM38 y al estudio Plató. Y pueden observar cómo el máximo beneficio en la reducción de los eventos isquémicos con eh, la utilización de eh, antiplaquetarios más potentes se documenta principalmente en los tres primeros meses. Si analizamos la evolución de las curvas a partir de los, premios, de los, de los primeros tres primeros meses, prácticamente las curvas son eh, paralelas o con una desviación muy discreta, sugiriendo que la eh, utilización de estos antiplaquetarios orales a medio o a más largo plazo tiene un efecto aditivo en la reducción de eventos isquémicos prácticamente inapreciable o muy discreto. Esta diapositiva indica las tasas de eventos isquémicos al año de haber presentado un síndrome coronario agudo, pero referidos a los estudios más antiguos que valoraron aspirina y clopidogrel con respecto a la aspirina, buena reducción, y los estudios más recientes, aspirina más parsugrel, el tritón, una reducción significativa con respecto al grupo control, y también en el plato, el ticagrelor más aspirina con respecto al grupo control. Sin embargo, la mortalidad es de un 10%. Esto quiere decir que de sus pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos que identifican correctamente, los estratifican, los aplican una estrategia invasiva y son sometidos a un tratamiento antitrombótico potente durante el seguimiento, uno de cada diez pacientes al cabo de un año habrá fallecido o habrá presentado un infarto agudo de miocardio o habrá presentado un accidente cerebrovascular. Por tanto, es posible que en el escenario después de un síndrome coronario agudo una estrategia antitrombótica más potente por los anticoagulantes orales podía tener una teórica justificación. No vamos a entrar en que hay unas claras indicaciones de anticoagulación, tanto en el escenario de los síndromes coronarios agudos como en otros escenarios. Es incuestionable que pacientes con eh, fibrilación auricular, eh, válvulas mecánicas, antecedentes de tromboembolismo o estados de hipercoagula hipercoagulabilidad tienen una clara indicación de la anticoagulación. Estos son eh, datos de las guías americanas referidos a infarto agudo de miocardio con elevación del segmento ST. También pacientes que tienen un trombo eh, en el ventrículo izquierdo asintomático con un nivel un poco menor de recomendación. También en pacientes con síndrome coronario agudo sin elevación del segmento ST hay unas indicaciones de anticoagulación muy claras, considerando que eh, se realizan en pacientes que tienen eh, otros procesos añadidos, fibrilación auricular, trombometrículo izquierdo, embolio cerebral, venoso pulmonar, pero no nos vamos a referir a estos pacientes, sino a los pacientes que después de un síndrome coronario agudo, a priori no requieren ninguna anticoagulación oral. Eh, se realizaron, nos han realizado diferentes estudios en los cuales se ha intentado evaluar si añadir la barfarina a la aspirina en comparación a la aspirina sola condiciona un impacto pronóstico favorable. Eh, hay múltiples estudios, hay tres, tres metanálisis de los cuales he resumido este, en el que pueden observar que una estrategia antitrombótica más potente condiciona una reducción de eventos isquémicos, pero a expensas de un marcado incremento en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos. Los otros dos metanálisis dan resultados similares, por lo cual, de forma habitual, es un estudio ya o un metanálisis antiguo, de forma rutinaria, no está justificada la administración de anticoagulación oral con la aspirina después de un síndrome coronario agudo. Sin embargo, en el momento actual disponemos de una serie de nuevos anticoagulantes, con un mecanismo de acción eh, marcadamente diferente. Mientras que los antagonistas de la vitamina K actúan en estos niveles de la anticoagulación, los nuevos anticoagulantes orales, ribaroxaban, bixaban o edoxaban, provocan una inhibición directa a nivel del factor 10A, o el davigatran, una inhibición directa a nivel de la trombina. Y estos fármacos, además, tienen unas características farmacológicas muy ventajosas. 
tanto porque su pico de acción es mucho más corto, son horas en comparación a días que tiene la barfarina, tanto con respecto a su vida media es más corta, son 12 o menos de 12 horas, mientras que la barfarina son 40 horas, y que también no requieren una monitorización de la anticoagulación en comparación a la barfarina, con lo cual la calidad a largo plazo, la calidad de los pacientes, puede mejorar sensiblemente. Eh, la práctica o la mayor parte de estudios en la introducción de estos pacientes en estudios eh, fase 3 se efectuó o se ha efectuado en pacientes con fibrilación auricular. No vamos a insistir en este aspecto, esta, este metaanálisis es un metaanálisis publicado recientemente en que analiza los cuatro estudios efectuados, el estudio RELAI con eh, David Gatran, el estudio ROCKET con Rivaroxaban, el estudio Aristóteles con Apixaban y el ENGAGE con eh, Edoxaban. Son todos ellos, vuelvo a repetir, estudios realizados en pacientes con fibrilación auricular no valvular. Los estudios tienen un cierto grado de concordancia, el, el grado de reducción en las tasas de eventos isquémicos hay una tendencia o es significativa con una eh, reducción global marcadamente significativa y eh, el aspecto más interesante es que las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos o bien no están aumentadas o están significativamente disminuidas, por ejemplo, con el apixaban o por ejemplo con el doxaban en los estudios Aristóteles y Engage. Es decir, estos fármacos aparentemente tienen un perfil claramente mucho más ventajoso y más seguro que la barfarina. Por tanto, eh, es posible sugerir que el efecto beneficioso que no consiguió la barfarina lo podían, lo podían conseguir en el escenario del postsíndrome coronario agudo los pacientes, eh, los pacientes después de esta entidad y con, y con estos nuevos anticoagulantes orales. Estos nuevos anticoagulantes o estos nuevos antitrombóticos se han valorado eh, en diferentes estudios. Este es el único estudio en el que fue evaluado el Davigatran, es un estudio fase 2, es el Redim, en pacientes con doble tratamiento antiplaquetario. El, eh, entre el 80 y el 90% de los pacientes ya, debía, ya recibían doble tratamiento. Se evaluaron cuatro dosis del Davigatran, 50, 75, 110 o 152 veces al día y el endpoint primario era un endpoint de sangrado. Pueden observar que en comparación al placebo de manera consistente, el Davigatran condicionó un incremento en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos prácticamente de manera dosis dependiente. Eh, no se realizó o no se ha realizado ningún estudio de fase 3 con este fármaco. Con la Pixaban se han efectuado dos estudios. Vamos a, vamos a presentar únicamente los estudios de fase 3, el estudio APRICE. Más de 7.000 pacientes, eh, eh, un, 85 de, un 81% sometidos a, do, a doble tratamiento antiplaquetario, fueron randomizados a Vixaman versus placebo. La dosis de Apixaban fue la dosis utilizada en el estudio de fibrilación auricular. El estudio se tuvo que detener prematuramente, no se observó ningún impacto beneficioso en las tasas de eventos isquémicos y se observó un incremento significativo en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos. El estudio concluyó que la adición de apixaban al doble tratamiento antiplaquetario después de un síndrome coronario agudo no estaba claramente justificado. El ribaroxaban en un estudio de fase 2, que es el Atlas ACS2 TB51, ha sido evaluado también en pacientes con un síndrome coronario agudo reciente. Este estudio tiene aspectos positivos, por lo cual quizás vamos a detenernos un poco. Más de 15.000 pacientes, también un porcentaje muy elevado de ellos tratados simultáneamente con aspirina más tinopiridina, fueron randomizados a dos dosis de ribaroxaban, 2,5 miligramos o 5 miligramos dos, dos veces al día. Estas dosis son marcadamente inferiores a las dosis utilizadas en el estudio de fibrilación auricular. En la evaluación del endpoint primario se observó una reducción significativa en las tasas de estos eventos en los pacientes que fueron randomizados a ribaroxaban versus placebo. En el análisis de los eventos eh, hemorrágicos eh, se observó una tendencia no significativa a un incremento no significativa de sangrado mortal o de hemorragia intracraneal mortal, pero sí se observó un incremento significativo en las tasas de hemorragia intracraneal eh, con una magnitud prácticamente dosis dependiente. Las diferencias siguen siendo significativas incluso con la dosis baja de ribaroxaban. El estudio concluye, por tanto, que el ribaroxaban sí que condiciona una reducción de eventos isquémicos, pero incrementa en estos pacientes por síndrome coronario agudo la tasa de eventos hemorrágicos. Sin embargo, la dosis de 2,5 miligramos parece ofrecer un perfil más favorable. Esta diapositiva muestra eh, los datos del mismo estudio, pero referido exclusivamente a los 2,5 miligramos dos veces al día de ribaroxaban, muerte, el, el endpoint primario global, muerte cardiovascular y muerte de cualquier causa. La dosis de 2,5 condicionó una marcada reducción en la tasa de estos eventos en comparación al grupo placebo. Pero quizás el aspecto más interesante es que ya a partir 
de los primeros días o primeros meses de randomización, las curvas experimentan una evolución divergente progresiva que sugieren un efecto aditivo adicional beneficioso en los pacientes que habían, que habían sido sometidos a la dosis de 2,5 miligramos de ribaroxaban. Eh, por tanto, hemos eh, analizado que eh, estos nuevos anticoagulantes orales actúan principalmente en la cascada de coagulación, ribaroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban y davigatran. Y aquí eh, figuran los antiplaquetarios orales. Hay un fármaco que es el borapaxar que tiene un mecanismo de acción sensible, sensiblemente diferente. Es un antagonista del receptor de la trombina. Provoca una inhibición en la agregación plaquetaria mediada por la trombina que tiene dos estudios que creo que es importante eh, eh, analizar. Uno de estos estudios es el estudio también fase 3, es el Tracer, en pacientes en los primeros siete días después de un eh, síndrome coronario agudo sin elevación del segmento ST, fueron casi 13.000 pacientes randomizados a borapaxar versus placebo. También era una población que mayoritariamente estaba tratada con doble dosis de aspirina, perdón, con eh, doble dosis de eh, tratamiento antiplaquetario. No se observó ningún impacto beneficioso de la asignación a borapaxar en comparación al placebo y sí un incremento significativo en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos. Eh, pueden observar que este estudio prácticamente reproduce los datos del eh, APRAIS con el APIXABAN. Desafortunadamente, eh, nuestro centro participó muy activamente en, en estos dos estudios. Hay un, 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 un estudio con el borapaxar, pero creo que puede tener datos que pueden ser interesantes, en los cuales se ha evaluado este, este fármaco una población de un, poco, de un riesgo eh, significativamente inferior. Es el estudio TRA2P TIMI 50, en el que más de 26.000 pacientes con historia previa de infarto de miocardio, accidente cerebrovascular o eh, enfermedad vascular periférica, los pacientes coronarios mayoritariamente tratados con doble tratamiento antiplaquetario, fueron randomizados a borapaxar o placebo. Una reducción significativa en la tasa de eventos isquémicos en comparación a los pacientes tratados con placebo con el borapaxar, pero de nuevo se observó un incremento en las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos que penalizaba al grupo de pacientes asignados al tratamiento antitrombótico más potente. Teniendo en cuenta eh, estos comentarios que hemos hecho, es decir, que en el postsíndrome coronario agudo estos, estos fármacos más potentes tienen un efecto beneficioso dispar con respecto a la tasa de eventos isquémicos, pero sí que son consistentes con respecto a las tasas de eventos hemorrágicos, la pregunta es si hay algún grupo de pacientes que pueda beneficiarse de estos fármacos. Esta diapositiva es una diapositiva del estudio Carisma en el subgrupo de pacientes con infarto previo, accidente cerebrovascular o... Eh, eh, enfermedad periférica. Los pacientes tratados con una estrategia antitrombótica más potente muestran una marcada reducción con curvas que experimentan una evolución divergente durante el seguimiento. Estos son datos del estudio Trilogy en que el Prasugrel en una población muy heterogénea eh, sin revascularizar, ya lo hemos comentado, fue evaluado en comparación al clopidogrel. El aspecto quizás más enigmático es porque al cabo de un año las curvas experimentan una evolución divergente progresiva favorable a los pacientes que habían sido sometidos a un tratamiento antitrombótico más potente. Ya hemos comentado el borapaxar en el TRA2P, también las curvas siguen una evolución divergente y también en el estudio ATLAS, el ribaroxaban, sobre todo la dosis de 2,5 miligramos, una evolución divergente. Esto quiere decir que probablemente hay subgrupos de pacientes que puedan beneficiarse de un tratamiento antitrombótico más potente. ¿Cuáles pueden ser estos pacientes? Únicamente podemos obtenerlos de análisis de subgrupos de los estudios que hemos comentado. Este es el eh, datos del Atlas ACS TIMI 51, pero referidos a los pacientes que se implantaron stents intracoronarios y pueden observar cómo la eh, asignación a ribaroxaban condicionó una reducción significativa en las tasas de trombosis de stent. El grupo de pacientes randomizados a ribaroxaban 2,5 miligramos en el análisis de la mortalidad cardiovascular en los pacientes estentados también mostraba una reducción significativa con una curva que en comparación al prasugrelo, al ticagrelor, tiene una divergencia progresiva durante el seguimiento. Estos son datos del estudio Tracer con borapaxar, pero referido a pacientes que en el estudio fueron sometidos a cirugía coronaria. Es un aspecto muy interesante porque estos pacientes mostraron una marcada reducción en la tasa de eventos isquémicos cuando fueron randomizados a borapaxar. Es enigmática también la explicación de este fenómeno. Es posible que eh, la eh, eh, indicación de cirugía condicionara un menor uso de clopidogrel y entonces quedó el borapaxar como fármaco antiplaquetario, digamos, más potente, o bien que la activación del PAR1 que inhibe el borapaxar sea un mecanismo en la obstrucción de eh, los bypasses coronarios. 
Y finalmente, este es un subestudio del TRADOS-P-T-50, eh, el Borapaxar, en el subgrupo de pacientes con infarto agudo de miocardio previo. El 78% de los pacientes seguían estando sometidos a tratamiento antiplaquetario. Hay una reducción significativa en el, en el endpoint combinado y también en la mortalidad cardiovascular favorable a los pacientes randomizados a, a Borapaxar. Por tanto, en conclusión... Eh, estos estudios de fase 3 con nuevos fármacos eh, antitrombóticos orales en pacientes después de un síndrome coronario agudo que están recibiendo tratamiento antiplaquetario condicionan una eficacia muy variable con un incremento consistente y significativo en el riesgo de sangrado. Los dos fármacos que han mostrado beneficio en la reducción de eventos isquémicos, el ribaroxaban o el volapaxar, pueden tener una justificación a largo plazo junto con tratamiento antiplaquetario eh, doble y pueden tener un papel en prevención secundaria siempre que su indicación se, re se realice en pacientes seleccionados con bajo riesgo para sangrado. De una manera absolutamente especulativa e intentando responder a la pregunta que se planteaba en la ponencia, potenciales indicaciones a la utilización de doble tratamiento antiplaquetario más un antitrombótico o más el borapaxar, se puede, o se puede reflexionar en hacerla en pacientes seleccionados con un bajo riesgo de sangrado a largo plazo y que, tenga recurrencia de eventos isquémicos a pesar del doble tratamiento antiplaquetario en pacientes sin opciones para la revascularización, que tengan un alto riesgo o que tengan un alto riesgo para eventos aterotrombóticos, pacientes que tengan un alto riesgo para la trombosis de estén, esto es un aspecto interesante, consistentemente todos los nuevos fármacos antiplaquetarios añaden una reducción significativa en las tasas de trombosis de estén y subgrupos de pacientes muy específicos, pacientes con ectasias coronarias severas cuya... Eh, protección teóricamente con la doble anti, eh, tratamiento antiplaquetario puede ser limitada o también pacientes con carga de trombo importante que eh, aproximaciones o estrategias recientes sugieren mantener la anticoagulación en estos pacientes durante varias semanas en este periodo posiblemente estos fármacos podían tener una potencial utilidad. En conclusión, y esta es la última diapositiva, existe un claro balance frágil entre el beneficio de riesgo en los pacientes con síndromes coronarios agudos. Si intentamos reducir las tasas o eh, la presentación de isquemia con una potencia antitrombótica superior, las tasas de sangrado van a aumentar de una manera muy importante. Estos nuevos fármacos antiplaquetarios y antitrombóticos probablemente están situados en este nivel, es decir, con una gama muy importante de incremento de eventos hemorrágicos. Por tanto, es obligado a intentar identificar a aquellos pacientes con bajo riesgo hemorrágico pero que se pueden beneficiar de una estrategia antitrombótica más potente. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Zerkiel, for this excellent conference. Now it's time for the audience to, to ask, but I have to tell you that we are going to permit only two questions, please. It's a very clear exposition. Te dice cuestión over de Marco. Thank you very much. A fantastic talk. Just uh, pushing you to go a little bit beyond the single uh, trial analysis. And my take home message from your overview is that triple does not seem to work. So you have to drop something. Is it a fair conclusion or you disagree with that? Sorry, I, I... You have, we have presented multiple studies. Yes. Every time there are three antitrombotic agents associated, it does not seem to work. You have some signal of benefit, which is overshadowed by a huge amount of bleeding liability. So my take home, irrespective of the agent, is that three agents simultaneously given, they simply too much. So three <laughs> is not a good number. Uh, it, it depends of the of the of the three antithrombotic treatments. Don't mean that they they have the same mechanism uh, over the same uh, coagulation ca cascade. The antiplatelets work in the uh, in the in the in the way of the antiplatelet on the uh, uh, anti-aggregation or uh, in the activation on the others. The Vigatran, uh, Apixaban, or uh, Borapaxar works in the in the in the in the way of the coagulation. And one important point is that. All this trial, the new oral anticoagulants, has an, an additional benefit effect in the stent thrombosis. And this suggests that probably the thrombin has a mechanism in the stent thrombosis, because even that these patients are under a double antiplatelet treatment, uh, the addition of a new, uh, more potent antithrombotic agent with a different mechanism gives an additional benefit. Do you 
has another question? Yes, Antonio. Yo te la pregunto en español. <ríe> eh, me ha parecido que, el, que has asociado el Borapaxar como anticoagulante. No. Por eso no. digo, el, a, lo mejor, no, no, no. A, a lo mejor el, no, no, no. El, la reflexión de, de Marco tiene mucho sentido, ¿no? A veces recargar todo, porque ahora si ponemos todo junto no. esto, no. acaba de ser aprobado el, el Borabaxar por la FDA. Entonces nos vamos a encontrar no tres agentes, nos vamos a encontrar cuatro. Uh -huh. ¿Qué opinión tienes tú? De... No, el, borap el Borapaxar actúa a nivel eh, de la inhibición de la trombina, sobre todo la activación plaquetaria inducida, inducida por la trombina. Está colocado, he colocado en la vía de la... De la quizás no hay tiempo para explicar mecanismos fisiopatológicos, aparecía a la izquierda, a la izquierda, la vía de la coagulación, on the right side appear, appears the, the, the way of the uh, activation and inhibition of the activation platelet. The Borapaxar is a uh, thrombin receptor antagonist and it works in the uh, platelet stimulation mediated by thrombine. In theory, the mechanism is quite different in comparison to the new oral anticoagulants. Okay. Go ahead with uh, your opinion in the possible fourth way therapy with three antiplatelet and one anticoagulant. <laughs> The, the problem is that the conclusion of, the, of, this, of these uh, different studies is very consistent. It's very consistent. Uh, but uh, all, 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 the, all the studies has a uh, dramatic increase in the incidence of, uh, of bleeding. The problem to, to do the indication of these of this new uh, uh, anticoagulant agents is identify the patient with high risk for long-term bleeding. The factors is quite different in comparison to the patients with uh, high risk for uh, short uh, treatment uh, related with the, with the uh, acute phase of acute coronary syndromes. There are several scores in the acute phase of acute uh, coronary syndromes who identify patients with high risk of ple for bleeding. There are not scores in the post-acute coronary syndromes to evaluate the, the risk associated. For this reason, probably it's more difficult to identify the patient with high risk in long-term treatment. To the last speaker. We we'll move to the third talk. Uh, I'm very, very honored to present Professor Lip. He's professor in cardiovascular medicine in the University of Birmingham. Uh, he's also visiting professor in other three universities in England, Denmark, and Serbia. He's an expert in this field. He's the chair of the consensus document of the European Society about antithrombotic therapy. In EF and acute coronary syndrome published in European Heart Journal in 2010. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, and firstly, thank you very much for the very warm invitation to be here presenting at this uh, meeting. My remit is to address the issue of atrial fibrillation, acute coronary syndrome, and the use of drug eluting stents, particularly also in the setting of PCI and angioplasty. And uh, this is, of course, a, a combination uh, requiring a very clear pattern of uh, treatment and a management strategy. Because if you think about it, we're, we're really juggling four balls in the air. We're trying to prevent stroke in the setting of atrial fibrillation. In a setting of acute coronary syndrome, we're trying to prevent recurrent cardiac ischemia. And if you're putting, doing a stent or angioplasty, you're trying to prevent stent thrombosis or recurrent, as I mentioned, recurrent uh, acute coronary syndrome. And finally, the fourth ball in the air is the issue about when you have combination antithrombotic therapy, as you've heard from the previous speaker, the risk of serious bleeding, particularly major bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage. But let's set the scene on what we're having to uh, deal with, because with atrial fibrillation, when you're trying to emphasize stroke prevention, all the contemporary guidelines emphasize the necessity of oral anticoagulant therapy. And the ESC guideline flowchart is shown here, because here in the ESC guideline, uh, the emphasis is initially identifying your low-risk patients who don't need any antithrombotic therapy. These low-risk patients are those with a chads score of zero if male, or a chads score one if female. Essentially, that is the category of age under 65 and lone atrial fibrillation. Subsequent to that step, patients with atrial fibrillation and one or more stroke risk factors can be considered for oral anticoagulant therapy. 
uh, you will see that as, uh, as the guidelines evolve, there's a preference for uh, the use of the non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. They have been previously referred to as novel or new oral anticoagulants. They're neither new nor novel these days. But if you see the text of the ESC guidelines, the NOACs offer efficacy, safety, and convenience compared to use of the vitamin K antagonist for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation. The bottom line is you're trying to prevent uh, strokes and it's oral anticoagulant therapy, whether that's delivered as a NOAC or whether you deliver that as well-controlled vitamin K uh, antagonist. The recent guidelines from the US, uh, the 2014 American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology and HRS guidelines uh, have just been published. Again, you will see the emphasis is effective stroke prevention is oral anticoagulant therapy. The only stroke risk score uh, recommended is the CHATS VASCO, and as you will see, uh, it uh, categorizes those at high risk would be a CHATS VASCO of two and above, where it's oral anticoagulant therapy again. So the bottom line is we are going to see more and more oral and patients with atrial fibrillation on oral anticoagulant. We know how prevalent atrial fibrillation is. Uh, we will be dealing with atrial fibrillation patients or anticoagulant and with concomitant vascular disease, coronary disease, uh, they will present with acute coronary syndrome uh, and or require an angioplasty. Uh, it is uh, in atrial fibrillation, the net clinical benefit if you're balancing stroke reduction against the potential for bleeding in virtually every case with patients with one or more stroke risk factors, the anticoagulated patients, that's the red lines there, do far better than the non-anticoagulated patients, and that's irrespective of stroke risk by the CHADS VAS score on the, on the x-axis or on the bleeding risk by the has bled score. Uh, the one exception in this situation is those with a CHADS VAS score of zero, where the risk is so low, there is no real advantage, no net clinical uh, advantage, no net benefit by the addition of oral anticoagulation therapy in this setting. Now, you've heard from a previous presentation that there is at least a little bit of evidence for giving oral anticoagulation therapy post-acute coronary syndrome. And that's not necessarily a, a new concept because uh, you, you were shown uh, uh, the, the Rothberg meta-analysis in a previous presentation. Here I show one from Salim Yusuf, and they're by and large, they are the same. But you could argue that these were done uh, in the pre-primary angioplasty era. It was the days before uh, good technology from uh, drug-eluting stents. Uh, and as you can see, just pick this panel here, if you look at the outcomes of mortality or myocardial infarction or the composite of death myocardial infarction or stroke, you will see the anticoagulated patients, the oral anticoagulated patients, essentially warfarin uh, at that time. Uh, that's the gray dark gray bars there, uh, much less compared to those control, in other words, aspirin. The downside, of course, is the risk of bleeding, because if you look at the major bleeds per thousand patients, you'll see how uh, if you have uh, oral anticoagulation therapy, uh, you may well be reducing the cardiovascular events, but what you do do is increase the risk of major bleeding and uh, serious bleeding, particularly intracranial hemorrhage. Now, uh, I, can I just make, the, make a point that actually warfarin or vitamin K antagonists are pretty good drugs in terms, of myocardial, in terms of protecting against myocardial infarction. And you also see that in contemporary clinical practice. This, is an, in, this is, uh, makes a point. This is a post hoc look at the warfarin arm of the RELY trial. Now, RELY was a, one of the contemporary phase three trials comparing the Bigatron versus warfarin. And this is looking at INR control, because if you have the, uh, in the warfarin arm, if you look at a patient subdivided by uh, time in therapeutic range as an index of their anticoagulation control. So here you have the patients uh, with good anticoagulation control defined as a TTR of above 65%, compared to those with less good anticoagulation control on warfarin. You see the MI rate uh, in those with good anticoagulation control is 0.49% per year, compared to 0.7% per year in those with less good anticoagulation control in the warfarin arm. So warfarin actually is a pretty good drug in terms of second prevention or preventing myocardial infarction patients, but it has to be good quality anticoagulant control. So what's the, let's have a reality check. I mentioned before atrial fibrillation is common. You're seeing a lot of these patients. Many of them are on anticoagulation therapy. What are the management strategies amongst European cardiologists? Here uh, in this slide and the next one I show, I show the uh, European Heart Rhythm Association EPYS survey. This is just a practice uh, survey of what actually European cardiologists do. And uh, it's probably fair to conclude that there's a degree of confusion out there because uh, everybody just does 
what they think is best. In a sense, uh, the first panel here, for example, looks at first-line pharmacological therapies on top of oral anticoagulants in AF patients presenting with an acute coronary syndrome. And you see uh, a, a pretty wide range. Uh, uh, sorry, the blues are warfarin patients. The, the, the reds are the dose on a NOAC. Uh, many, many would uh, do an angioplasty whilst on uninterrupted anticoagulation, some interrupt, some stop, some wait for the INR to drop to less than, tr less than uh, three, um, some give fibrolysis. You can see there's uh, just a wide range in practice. Uh, in terms of concomitant antiplatelet drugs, uh, by and large, most do add in aspirin plus clopidogrel, but you will see also the addition of prazigrel sometimes. Sometimes you get uh, aspirin and heparin and uh, uh, all other treatments, and sometimes you don't get any added therapies at all. So you see a wide range of practice differences on top of, on top of oral anticoagulants in an AF patient presenting with a, with, with a non-STEMI. Uh, here, uh, on this panel here, uh, you look also at a concomitant uh, management post-discharge, uh, uh, and most do have antiplatelet therapy, but you see um, uh, in the, in the periangioplasty setting, but you see some get glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors, uh, some get uh, an, a single antiplatelet, either clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrelor, some get aspirin only, some get heparin only. Again, a wide range in relation to uh, clinical practice in terms of type of stent. Uh, there seems to be a preponderance of using bare metal stents only because of the perception that uh, you don't need prolonged antiplatelet therapy. Now, how do you deal with this? Well, uh, this is, uh, in a sense, a difficult area. And in 2010, uh, the ESC Working Group of Thrombosis, uh, in collaboration with the European Heart Rhythm Association and the European Association of PCI, uh, put together this consensus document. This was published in Thrombosis Hemostasis in 2010. Essentially, it's a nice collaboration between the clotters, the rhythm doctors, and the balloonatics. Uh, I would also point out that there is an update of this document uh, coming out in this year, uh, and this time, just to show the great interest in this management problem, it is not only a document in 2014 from the ESC Working Group on Thrombosis, it's a joint consensus document from the Working Group Thrombosis, ERA, European Association, PCI, uh, Association of Acute Cardiac Care as well. So it's, it's a joint document from uh, four major ESC bodies. But uh, since that document is not published, I'll just show you what this present document shows. Uh, this is the table from that. In fact, it's the table which is similar to the, the table that appeared in the 2010 ESC guidelines for AF management. And uh, by and large, it, re it recommends a period of triple therapy initially. That's triple therapy, uh, oral anticoagulant plus two antiplatelet drugs. And after a period of triple therapy, it goes on to anticoagulant plus single antiplatelet. And then after a year, if er the patient is totally stable, the patient can be managed with oral anticoagulant therapy alone. The period of triple therapy depends on a number of things, whether it's an acute or elective presentation, uh, whether it depends on bleeding risk, uh, as defined by the Hasblad score and the ESC guidelines, depends on the type of stent, whether it's the bare metal or, or drug eluting stent uh, in relation to the duration of triple therapy in the immediate post-PCI or ACS setting. And this is for the AF patients who require anticoagulation therapy. So three things, bleeding risk, type of stent, acute or elective presentation. Now there was the perception that our colleagues in North America did think completely different. And uh, it was very nice that David Faxon and Dominic, who's uh, on our panel here, put together this consensus document from North America. And um, the, the Europeans on the uh, consensus document uh, I mentioned on the earlier slide were pleasantly surprised because, in fact, uh, there were more similarities than actual differences. So, actually, uh, Dominic, we're actually far more alike than we like to admit. Uh, so, it's very nice that, again, a period of triple therapy, uh, depending on a number of reasons, whether acute or type of stent or bleeding risk, then going to anticoagulant plus single antiplatelet, then in the long term, as you can see, anticoagulant alone indefinitely uh, for these patients who are at high risk. But the, but the ballpark has changed. A number of things have changed. Well, firstly, in terms of management strategies for, 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 for these patients, uh, a, n a number of studies and also therapy changes or advances have occurred. Um, uh, firstly, I wish to mention the WUS trial. 
or depending on your pronunciation, the worst trial. It is, this is a trial of patients who need, needed anticoagulation, and they were randomized to a strategy of triple therapy, in other words, anticoagulant plus two antiplatelets, versus a strategy of two antiplatelets, in other words, anticoagulant plus clopidogrel. And uh, triple therapy was continued up to 24 months. So the primary endpoint was all bleeding. So no surprises, if you give somebody triple therapy for 12 months, what do you expect? Significantly more all bleedings compared to a strategy of, of dual therapy. And the, major, and the bleeding, as you can see from this table here, is largely driven by the minor bleeds, the Timmy minor bleeds. Major bleeds, not significantly different. The other aspect from Wuss, which was interesting, and why it attracted a lot of attention, because that is in terms of mortality, this was a secondary endpoint, because there was certainly a suggestion that mortality was greater in the patients randomized to uh, triple therapy compared to dual therapy. Uh, so there's therefore been a move in a sense that uh, we should drop the aspirin uh, as part of the, uh, when you manage patients with AF or who need anticoagulation, you can just manage these patients with anticoagulant plus single antiplatelet therapy. But can, can I just suggest hold your horses because uh, in a sense that you should look into detail with some of the trials. Now this was, this has been pitched as a trial of atrial fibrillation patients on anticoagulants. Well, actually it's not. Uh, AF was only in, uh, in about 65% percent of the worst trial or worst trial. Uh, outcome was driven by the minor bleeds, as I mentioned. It's an open study, and you've heard from Stuart Poker earlier in an elegant presentation on the, uh, the difficulties of such an open study. It was certainly under power for the hard endpoints, um, and uh, treatment duration is an issue, uh, because in, a, in, in yours and my clinical practice, very rarely do I continue triple therapy continuously for 12 months. Uh, the use of PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, uh, there was a variable use of bare metal stents versus drug eluting stents. Some of the patients were acute, some were elective. There was also a combination of radio and femoral approaches uh, used in, in, in the trial per se. It is it's pitched as a real world trial, but at, uh, at the very least, I would just suggest this is a hypothesis generating study. Uh, so please, don't go out and start changing your clinical practice managing AF patients on anticoagulation, because the worst trials suggest that we probably need more trials. Uh, as part of a triple therapy strategy, uh, the other practical aspect is whether you can use one of the new antiplatelet drugs that have been already discussed in one of the earlier presentations. Now, not a lot of randomized trial evidence there to actually suggest uh, or, uh, you know, what to do, but uh, here is one uh, observational study uh, where prazugrel was uh, compared to clopidogrel in an observational study as part of a triple therapy regime. And what you do see in terms of the cardiovascular or thrombotic events, there was no difference in terms of triple therapy strategy, whether you use prazogrel or clopidogrel. This is not significant. But what you do see is that in a prazogrel strategy as part of triple therapy, you do increase the risk of bleeding. So no big surprises there. And you'll find that if you are, as part of a triple therapy strategy in terms of anticoagulant plus two antiplatelets, uh, you will find that uh, the general consensus is please continue to use clopidogrel until we get a bit more evidence with the new antiplatelet drugs, whether prazogrel or ticagrelor. The other aspect, of course, is as you heard on the, one of the morning early morning presentations, is that uh, we are dealing with an evolving field. Stent, stent uh, technology has been changing, and there's been a lot uh, of interest into seeing whether we can actually shorten the duration of, of, of associated uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And this trial was mentioned uh, in one of the presentations this morning. This was the optimized trial. And in terms of a, trying to randomize patients to uh, short term versus long term, in other words, three months versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy, if you look at the primary composite endpoint, uh, which included uh, not only the thrombotic endpoints, but also major bleeding, you find that there was not really a lot of difference uh, between a short term and a long term strategy. The three months versus 12 months uh, in, in the era of the new generation uh, uh, um, stents. Now, um, this is um, also because in the sense that the longer you keep patients on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, um, there's no surprises, you will get 
uh, a higher risk of bleeding. This is uh, one such trial from, from Marco, who is present here, uh, where essentially if you compare six months um, versus 24 months of associated clopidogrel, uh, you don't necessarily any, have any impact in relation to the uh, efficacy outcomes. But what you do see, of course, is a prolonged um, treatment. What you do see is an increase in uh, the rate of major bleeding. So uh, a lot of interest to us trying shortening the duration of associated uh, uh, at dual antiplatelet drugs, and that's relevant in relation to um, combination with anticoagulant therapy. You've had a presentation earlier about bioabsorbable stents, and of course, as I mentioned, stent technology is evolving whether this will have or have not any uh, impact in how we manage our patients with uh, uh, AF um, who are anticoagulated and present an acute coronary syndrome and need a stent, whether this will have any impact there or not. Uh, time will tell because there's certainly no data. Uh, what you do see is at least from some of the uh, literature, at least the efficacy is on preserving, uh, with the bioabsorbable stent, is on preserving lumen patency. Um, but th whether this translates outcome into, into um, outcomes, particularly in the setting of anticoagulated patients, uh, we just don't have the data. Um, novel oral anticoagulants or non-vitamin K ant oral anticoagulants have been mentioned in previous presentation, and of course this is um, um, a changing landscape, and this is the ERA practical guide for the management of these patients in atrial fibrillation patients. Uh, but what I want to highlight a few uh, points because the, with, the, with the NOACs, with the non-VK oral anticoagulants, there's been a concern whether or not uh, this are or are not related to uh, an excess of myocardial infarction events. And this, of course, this whole discussion uh, started, of course, uh, with the RELY trial when there was a numerical, um, in, uh, numerically increased numbers of myocardial infarction events in the dibigitron treated patients compared to the warfarin-treated patients, 0.8% per year, compared to 0.6% per year. This was not significant. I would point out in the RELY trial that the average TTR in the trial was 64%, so well-controlled warfarin. And I made the point earlier that warfarin actually is a good drug in terms of preventing myocardial infarction. In the Rocket AF trial, the TTR in the whole trial was 55%, so not so good. But if you look at the MI events of rivaroxaban, it was 0.9% per year. On the warfarin-treated patients, it was 1.1% per year. So there was a, trend, there was a numerical uh, but non-significant uh, difference towards a trend towards a little bit less myocardial infarction events numerically uh, with the rivaroxaban-treated patients compared to warfarin. Now, if you look at the Rocket AF North American uh, cohort, so these are the North American patients in the Rocket AF trial, where the quality of anticoagulant control was far better, 64% TTR on average. Uh, MI events on rivaroxaban, 1.5% per year. MI events on warfarin, 1.3% per year. Not significant, but you will see now numerically, uh, the, it's uh, looking a little bit higher on the, on the rivaroxaban-treated patients compared to the warfarin-treated patients. In ENGAGE, another factor 10 inhibitor with edoxaban, TTR in the warfarin uh, arm was very good, 68%. But you'll see here now, uh, again, uh, new, in terms of the high-dose strategy, the 60 milligram arm, 0.7%, uh, but in the low-dose strategy, which is 30 milligrams edoxaban, 0.89% per year, compared to the warfarin-treated patients, 0.7% per year. So numerically, with edoxaban 30 at least, a larger number of MI patients in the edoxaban treated patients compared to warfarin. I would also point out for edoxaban, there's a venous thromboembolism trial called Hokusai, where you'll see in the, in the uh, edoxaban treated patients, again, numerically more MIs in the edoxaban treated patients compared to the warfarin treated patients in the Hokusai. Last but not least, if you look at active W, which was a trial comparing warfarin versus aspirin clopidogrel combination therapy, where the uh, TTR was about 64% again, you see this is 0.8% per year, compared to 0.5% per year in the warfarin treated patients. So numerically more MIs in the aspirin clopidogrel treated patients uh, compared to warfarin treated patients. So perhaps we should stop using aspirin clopidogrel when we manage our acute coronary syndrome patients because it's bad for you. 
Now, in terms of uh, managing uh, these AF patients who require a PCI, uh, first thing is, are they systemically anticoagulated? You can do some simple tests, as the ERA practical guide suggests. With the Bigatron, you can measure the APTT if that's prolonged, the patient is systemically anticoagulated. Otherwise, you can do a dilute thrombin time or an acrine clotting time. With Apixaban, uh, there's not a lot of data when the, when the practical guide came up, but you can certainly do an antifactor 10A. Uh, uh, assay with Riveroxaban, uh, the PT, which may be prolonged, but you do need some local calibration. Uh, but for the antifactor 10A uh, assay, that's, that's probably a bit more reliable. And essentially, if you're trying to uh, approach these patients, if, for an, if you, your question is, if you have a, need a prime PCI, yes, you do it in a STEMI situation. Uh, if you uh, want to give fibrinolysis, you need to know if the patient is systemically anticoagulated. In the bigger trial treated patient, you check the APTT. For real roxaban patients, treat, uh, check the PT. Uh, and in terms of trying to, so if you know these are prolonged, you manage the patient as if the patient is systemically anticoagulated. Now, um, what about the setting in, of, of uh, long-term chronic setting after uh, the patient has had the ACS or the stent? Now, the, uh, the APRAISE-2 trial has been discussed on a, a previous presentation, but this is to point out that apixaban at the AF stroke prevention dose was used in the APRAISE-2 trial. And this trial was stopped early because there was no evidence of efficacy, but certainly an increase in serious bleeding uh, in these patients in the APRAISE-2 trial. The ADLAS-2 trial has also been discussed. This was rivaroxaban, but this is, not, this is not rivaroxaban at the AF stroke prevention dose. This was mini-dose rivaroxaban in a BID regime. And in ADLAS, there was a benefit on some of the cardiovascular events, uh, but at the, at the risk of uh, an increase in some of the serious bleeding events. So just to say in ADLAS, uh, there was some benefit for mini-dose BID rivaroxaban, but this is at the cost of uh, some of the more serious bleeding uh, aspects. So, and the serious bleeding aspects pertain to the risk of major bleeding and the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, but not fatal bleeding. So uh, I, I do want to leave you with the message that irrespective of anticoagulant use, whether it's warfarin or whether it's a NOAC, if you add antiplatelet therapy, if you, uh, you will increase the risk of bleeding, whether that's major bleeds or whether that's intracranial bleeds. And uh, in terms, these, this just looks at uh, the trials um, in terms of major bleeding or intracranial bleeding. Uh, this one is particularly, this is from Rely, uh, and you see this step up, whether uh, in patients, um, these are patients on warfarin with no concomitant antiplatelet. That's with warfarin plus a single antiplatelet. That's warfarin, the white uh, warfarin plus dual antiplatelet. But you see the step up is evident with, uh, for major bleeding for warfarin, for the bigotron 110, for the bigotron 150. You could see marginally, uh, at least numerically, probably not significant, uh, where you'll see the, 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 the rate per year on the Bigatron 110 is probably a little bit less compared to the warfarin treated patients. Again, consistent with the main RELY trial. But just to re-emphasize the point, uh, if you add any antiplatelet to an anticoagulant, you increase the risk of bleeding. You also see this in the other trials, but I want to also emphasize the relative um, a treatment effect is maintained. This is the Aristotle where apixaban was compared to warfarin, and this is the analysis in relation to whether or not aspirin was used concomitantly. Uh, you'll find that the p-values for interaction are non-significant. In other words, the effect size in terms of efficacy or the effect size in terms of safety of apixaban compared to warfarin was not significantly different whether or not aspirin was there. So the absolute rates may be higher uh, for example, you will see for a uh, major bleed, you will see uh, that the aspirin-treated patients uh, on a, uh, are higher compared to the no aspirin-treated patients. So the absolute rates are higher, but the, but the effect size uh, is non-significant. The p-value uh, for interaction is non-significant. So ultimately, we're going to need randomized trials with the NOACs. Uh, just to point out, two are in um, uh, progress, or so two have been, um, some, one started, one is uh, just about to start. Uh, the Pioneer AF trial is investigating reroxaban uh, in this uh, setting. It's comparing the traditional strategy of, uh, of, of uh, VKA-based uh, therapy uh, uh, compared to a uh, reroxaban-based strategy 
compared to a WUS-type rivaroxaban strategy uh, in, in, in patients with atrial fibrillation who require a stent. Uh, there will be a small proportion who can get either prazugel or ticagrelor. Um, and uh, just to point out to it, uh, the bigger trial, there's the Reduo trial. The Reduo trial is, uh, tr is more powered for some of the uh, uh, thrombotic primary endpoints, uh, efficacy endpoints, and these are patients randomized to the bigger trial, 150, the bigger trial, 110, or warfarin uh, with in, in association. So the warfarin arm is the traditional warfarin um, uh, plus antiplatelet therapy strategy. This, the two dibigatron arms are more in keeping with the WUS type uh, anticoagulant plus, uh, plus clopidogrel, and, and depending on the investigator, uh, ticagrelor uh, as well uh, in, in the setting of preventing hard outcomes, uh, thrombotic events, death, myocardial infarction, and stroke, uh, and also looking at the risk of major bleeding. So let me conclude, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. In, uh, essentially, I re-emphasize the, po uh, the, the point again. We are, we are really juggling four balls in the air. We are in atrial fibrillation patients. You are trying to uh, prevent strokes in ACS. You are trying to prevent recurrent cardiac ischemia and also stent thrombosis. And have to add into that the fourth ball, uh, the risk of major bleeding, particularly intracranial hemorrhage. But if you add antiplatelet to any anticoagulant, you will increase the risk of serious bleeding and intracranial bleeds. Uh, we do need some more data with the new antiplatelet drugs, whether it's prasugrel or ticagrelor. Uh, we, there's also the question, there's also a practical consideration with drug eluting stents versus bare metal stents. But uh, as I've emphasized, technology is evolving. The new generation drug eluting stents seem to be able to offer possibilities where you might have a much shortened period of, um, of having to have dual antiplatelet drugs um, compared to the older generation drug eluting stents, whether or not bioabsorbable stents will make a difference or other, other new stent technologies uh, would make a difference. Nobody, uh, we, we have yet to uh, see that. There's also the practical consideration about vitamin K antagonists versus NOACs. Um, and um, one thing you should be aware of is would the ACS dose of a NOAC uh, for, uh, which has been shown to a benefit, um, which is essentially rivaroxaban in the mini-dose BID regime, offer adequate stroke prevention, uh, which is um, ne necessary in the setting of atrial fibrillation patients. Uh, bottom line is we still need more tr clinical trials, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, a couple of them at least already are, have started or are ongoing. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, time for two short questions. Uh, first, I would like to thank you for your uh, magnificent uh, presentation. I would like to know your point of view, that knowing in the patients, when you read the 2010 consensus on antithrombotic therapy, in patients with atrial fibrillation and uh, acute coronary syndromes, you read that uh, after the first year, mm, you always recommend just anticoagulant therapy with uh, antivitamin K uh, antagonist. Uh, what do you think that most patients in the real life don't achieve the timing therapeutic range of more of 65%? Uh, in the real life, we have 40, 50 percent. Do these patients are really protected against myocardial infarction? Well, that's a very good question. So in, in the setting after 12 months, well, in the setting of stable vascular disease, so arbitrarily defined by 12 months where they're completely stable, uh, the current guidelines order and uh, recommend anticoagulant therapy, monotherapy. Mm. Yes, you're right. In, uh, Anticoagulant therapy means well-controlled warfarin, otherwise you're not really doing it much benefit at all. So in those patients, make efforts to get good time and therapeutic range. The other alternative, put them on a decent dose of a, uh, novel, of a novel or anticoagulant. So I, I, don't think, I don't have any problems about that. Dr. Asambola? Uh, I have a comment and I have a question. My comment in, in my overview you say that uh, simplicity is best, but uh, for clinicians, the use, the assessment of Hasblet is not easy and in, a, in the clinical practice. 
and in the other uh, way, um, uh, the recommendations for the use of uh, antithrombotic uh, strategy in patients with um, acute coronary syndromes uh, with um, atrial fibrillation who need uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is uh, a light uh, cumbersome and light is writing in the, in the guidelines. And this is my overview, and I okay. would like to well, say you well, and the other. And my question is uh, that uh, summarizing the guidelines uh, for um, treatment in patients with acute coronary syndromes of uh, that, that uh, who need to uh, understand uh, is a simple therapy for everyone. So, uh, do, uh, do you consider? Uh, the use of dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with low risk, uh, low thromboembolic risk? Okay, uh, very good points. Well, firstly, has bled uh, in terms of the, how complex it is. Well, I can certainly tell you it's much more simple compared to the hemorrhagic score. If you can remember that acronym, uh, I, can, I can buy you a drink after. Okay, because that's more difficult to uh, remember. It's also more, has blood is also more simple than the atria score where you get uh, different weighing for different risk factors. And last but not least, has blood has been shown to be even, uh, to perform better in prediction of bleeding compared to hemorrhages and compared to the atria score. So if you've got a simp the simplest score, which has been the, proven to be the, the best, and it's been validated in VKA patients, it's been validated in non-VKA patients, so why not use it? Okay. But as a new score, it does take time to just to get used to it. We use this in our clinical practice, so we don't see that a big problem. Uh, and nowadays, you can download an app um, uh, for you to check it. In terms of the uh, triple therapy, um, as, as I mentioned, the consensus, the guidelines and the uh, consensus statement, both from Europe and North America, um, for the atrial fibrillation patients, I, th I think that's very much still this um, uh, uh, to have a period of triple therapy. If anything, the focus is now to try and shorten the duration of triple therapy, particularly now that we have better stent technology and we also know that um, we can probably get away with it in terms of the serious uh, thrombotic or bleeding events from some of the more recent randomized trials. So for, uh, I think uh, it, it's not unreasonable that you should maintain the current uh, recommendations of using triple therapy initially after the period of triple therapy is anticoagulant plus single antiplatelet, at least from the WUST trial, it tells you what anticoagulant plus clopidogrel is not a bad drug, then after a year, anticoagulant alone. Um, so um, it's, 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 it's not a reasonable to pro approach it that way. Okay, Malcolm. And after this, will we be finished? I promise just a, a short question. Uh, enjoyed your presentation very much. Um, and I was pleased to see uh, in the two trials that you presented at the end of the ones that are just uh, uh, being embarked upon that there, um, I think it, as I recall, each of those uh, had an experimental arm that uh, was without aspirin. And I'm just wondering, uh, in your best guess or estimate, do you think that we're going to find that we have seriously um, uh, overestimated the incremental b benefit of aspirin when added to clopidogrel in patients with MI and uh, PCI? Because this is really, are we gonna be talking about triple therapy in the future or dual therapy? Uh, very good points. Uh, well, for, uh, uh, firstly, to start with the control statement, I think there probably is a, there, there's probably an aspirin consp conspiracy out there because most of the trials for prevention for aspirin have been done a few decades ago. That's the days before fairly powerful cardiovascular prevention strategies like ACE inhibitors and statins, and we're also controlling blood pressure much better, et cetera, like that. Now, in this, in this particular setting, uh, when, when you do look at the, some of the earlier trials, uh, particularly post-stent, um, certainly just the anticoagulant, the single antiplatelet, wasn't as good as trying to add in, add in um, dual antiplatelet on top. Um, and, and I think, um, we may be seeing the situation that um, 
in the non-AF patient post-BCI, particularly with new anticoagulants, you may be able to drop the aspirin earlier than, earlier than we, we are doing right now. And secondly, with the new stent technologies that, uh, that we are using, uh, I think we can get away with it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.